Grant Schofield here with a pre-Cure Preventionist Cure podcast. They're joining me, Kayla, from our R&D team. Hi, Kayla. Hey, Grant. And now we're on to part two of our series with registered nutritionists, PhD candidate, and all-round uh, interesting nutrition person, Julianne Taylor. Hi, Julianne. Hi. Hi, Grant. Hi, Kayla. Hey, welcome back. And we really want to get into the list of both of what where you're a super expert at the moment, which is the idea of autoimmune conditions. So if someone has something that says autoimmune, what does that even mean? Yeah, so autoimmune is where your body makes antibodies against its own tissue or organ or something in your body. So it's autoantibodies. So normally you know, as you know, your antibodies are what protects you. Like when you get COVID or have a vaccine, you make certain antibodies so that when you're confronted with that pathogen the next time round, you can come out and bark it, knock it off, kill it, get rid of it really quickly. So for some reason, our immune system gets confused and we make antibodies against our own tissue. And there's probably about 80 or more autoimmune diseases so you could have autoantibodies against um and with Hashimoto's against thyroid peroxidase which is one of the um enzymes that your thyroid needs oh so so the body specifically has decided that that thyroid enzyme is something that doesn't really like I've been a little bit pejorative because it's not thinking in that way but, and it, and it, yeah. but it's attacking it yeah, it's seeing it as a foreign protein instead of belonging to you. Yep. And it starts attacking it. And in the process, there is generally inflammation um, and death or destruction or damage to that tissue that the antibodies are attacking or marking. Okay. And another example is uh, different types of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, so there's different. There's a bunch of different types of arthritis. Um, the one I'm studying is rheumatoid arthritis. So there are antibodies called anti-CCP citrullinated protein antibodies, and rheumatoid factor are the main ones, um, and they cause inflammation or damage in the joint, and the joint builds up kind of a thick inflamed lining and there's destruction of the joint as well due to inflammation. So is there, are there particular proteins in the joint area that, that the body sees as, as a problem? Yeah, yeah. So um, around the cartilage area, I believe, um, those, the synovial membrane of the joints is what's attacked. So... How did you get it to this? Did you have Hashimoto's yourself or do you, do you have quirks with that? Or Yes, yeah, so how I got into this whole shebang in the first place was my mother has, well, my mother had lupus, has lupus. Um, so, and I inherited all the exact same symptoms as her. So when I was about 18, I started getting, one of my knees would swell up, get very fluidy, get things like Baker's cysts, which is a, bubble of fluid out the back of my knee um my neck was really really painful and inflamed my jaw joints got really inflamed and I mean at one point I could you know only open my mouth a couple of fingers to eat food for months on end wow. um so I had all that from the age of 18 to uh, the zone diet helped quite a lot actually my um it improved so I knew that diet could help things but then when I started working with um, the paleo diet, which I got introduced to via working at Cross, a CrossFit gym, I, I looked at the connection that um, Lorraine Cordain was talking about between cereal grains and autoimmune disease. And I was like, this is just so fascinating. So I immediately thought, this is a self-experiment. Let's go on the paleo diet. So I went on paleo, which takes out grains, legumes, dairy um, and processed foods and I'd already been fairly low grain you know like with the with the zone diet but I wasn't gluten-free and within three weeks of being gluten-free my 
I had like a big ganglion cyst on my wrist and it shrunk away. I'd had that for 10 years. Um, wow. Yeah. 10 my, years. 10 years. Yeah. Like just a bump on my wrist. And I used to come and it used to come and go, you know, you could bat it with a Bible or something. <laughs> that was an old fashioned way of dealing with it. You bat it with a Bible and, um, the um, <laughs> ganglion cyst would kind of burst and then it would fill up again. Um, yeah. It's so, but if I'd go on a long walk or do a lot of exercise, what my left knee in particular would start kind of swelling up with fluid and become quite warm. And anyway, in three weeks, all of that joint pain of inflammation, which by now was minimal compared to what it had been, just completely went. So I was like, this is amazing. Like I've had this for what? 30 years of joint inflammation coming and going. And yes, it had improved with diet and supplements, but it hadn't disappeared until I did the paleo diet. And then I just, I, I, I just got so interested in it. And I was, um, during my PG dip, which I did just after this, I heard about some women, a couple of women in New Zealand with rheumatoid arthritis who had done the autoimmune protocol or the paleo, some version of that. And they had pretty much gone symptom free. And I thought that's really fascinating. So for my last part of my um, PG dip, I did a 30 credit qualitative study where I interviewed 10, I, um, I did, it was worldwide. So I just put it on some um, websites and asked for people who had rheumatoid arthritis, who'd used a paleo type diet and had it helped their symptoms so within a very short space of time I found 10 people and interviewed each of them for a qualitative interview and put that together as a um as a like a dissertation for my last 30 credits and that was what got me interested in rheumatoid specifically and I decided that just to focus things in um and eventually it you know, do my masters that I wanted to focus just on rheumatoid arthritis. And I really wanted to do a study that I used the autoimmune protocol because all of these people are anecdotally saying, hey, it's working, but nobody has done a study. So it should be studied. And, you know, people go online and go, well, how come I don't know about this? How come my doctor doesn't tell me to do this? How come my dietitian doesn't tell me to do this? And having come from, you know, a postgraduate background and you know when you do your essays, you look at the clinical papers and base what you write on the clinical papers that have been done. So knowing that, I can say to people, look, the study hasn't been done. That's why clinicians don't know about it. That's why doctors don't know about it. That's why rheumatologists don't know about it. So they're not going to tell you about something that hasn't got a study to back it up. Um, that's why they're not telling you to do that. So, yeah, this other world, whole world exists, right? But the whole N equals one world and the internet, and then the N equals many of the social media groups that emerge from that to support mm. that, which is an interesting tension, isn't it? And, and, and I, I suppose the second part to that is that there's astonishment by people, and then I don't know if it would turn to anger in some people, or just dismay about. I had a student who's had, had discovered this in around the 50s that it resolved some lifelong symptoms. You're just thrilled about that. But um, her dad had actually recently passed away and had, had those symptoms his whole life, which I think had you know, generally diminished his quality of life substantially. And, mm. and she was sort of grieving for that. Uh, it can understand those things, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is like people do find this stuff on the internet that we have got that resource now so and people aren't getting results through their doctors or they don't want to be on medication yeah they'll just find things and try it out because other people have said it worked for me so right but into the brave new world of julia taylor's doctoral research which is to take a, a more specific form that autoimmune protocol and apply that to mm. people with rheumatoid arthritis so, so how do you you come across the, this, like, should we call it AIP, what I protocol? AIP, yeah. Yeah. And what is it? So the AIP, the original idea of it came from Lorraine Cordain again. Um, 
and he and his team were looking at the connection between food and leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability to be more accurate and they started looking at what foods might be mimicking antigens um, or increasing intestinal permeability and then his or um, acting as an adjuvant. So an adjuvant is something that helps substances cross the epithelial the gut epithelial barrier and they often use adjuvants in medications and a common one that you'll see not so much in medication is in curcumin so they use piperine which is a pepper um, extract to help curcumin cross the epithelial barrier so it can be effective so there are substances in foods that can do one or all of those things. And so he looked at what are all the foods, let's take out all the foods that could be contributing to substances crossing the epithelial barrier. And let's so, take so, all so of those So just out. to get this right, so I understand it quickly, so that either the gut becomes more permeable and stuff flows from the gut into the bloodstream that mm-hmm. wouldn't otherwise be there, and that acts like an antigen, in other words, stimulates antibodies. Is mm-hmm. that one way? Yep. Yep. Correct. And then the second way is that they could, those things could somehow piggyback their way in on another substance and get up in the bloodstream, same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it can be, yeah, so yeah. in some way they're translocated either through the paracellular pathway, which just means between the cells in the gut because the tight junctions have loosened up yeah. and they're allowing peptides or little sections of proteins to bypass going through the cell or translocated by kind of being pulled through the cell by one of these um, adjuvants. And is there a third way where things are going through just normally, not because of that, but for some reason that person has a has a immune response to them where other people wouldn't? Um, like is that the idea of say some of the glutens yeah, that, and gliders? The other part stuff? of it is the inf- in inflaming your gut epithelium. So, I mean, gluten in people with celiac disease does this. They get an inflammatory response in their gut epithelium. And then when you get an inflammatory response because of the interaction with gluten and your epithelium, and then you bring a whole lot of, you know, cytokines and um, cells coming in to kind of fix the damage. Okay, so anyway, let's get into the AIP. So that you, yeah, you, you, oh, and sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the other the other factor is um, your gut dysbiosis. So, um, Fasano, who's a celiac disease researcher, he came up with this idea that there are several layers to um, contracting um, an autoimmune disease. So you've got the gut dysbiosis. So we see that in pretty much every autoimmune disease that I've looked at the literature for, like Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, and closing spondylitis, you see the bacteria is not the same as in a healthy control. And that bacteria itself can cause the antigenic or cause inflammation. So, and the, what you put into your body feeds the gut bacteria. So that's another way that um, you can changing diet will help so or taking all those factors into consideration taking out the foods that could be antigenic or cause increased dysbiosis or cause um, leaky gut so it's an elimination diet takes out a bunch of foods and then ideally once you've seen improvement over eight to 12 weeks, you start adding foods back in to see which might be contribute more to your inflammation than other foods. And the idea is to eventually get as many foods back into your diet as you can, but leave out those ones that seem to be inflammatory for you. So it sounds to me like there's, you're pairing right back to virtually the, the minimum of, of things that are least likely to cause anything. What would those minimum be? Yeah, that's, that's, it's, I mean, and this is an area that we don't know for sure, but, you know, working with AIP, they've decided that there's a certain minimum, which is um, unprocessed animal proteins, fish, 
and seafood. Um, all your fruits and vegetables, including your root vegetables, but not the nightshade groups because they have some chemicals that are inflammatory for your gut. And the nightshade group includes onions, capsicums. Nightshades are your part of the deadly nightshade group. Um, nightshades, <laughs> which gives you a clue, really. Um, <laughs> so they've got these things called glycoalkaloids, which your gut doesn't like. Not everybody, but in vulnerable people. Um, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, all your peppers and capsicums, and certain other things like um, goji berries and tamarillos. Are onions on there? No. No, no, they're uh, the... Why um, do I think that? They're the... What are they called? Polyosaccharides. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, that's where yeah, they get they, eliminated from. Yeah, that's out of the FODMAPs, which is yeah. a different category altogether. Yeah. Yeah, so you can eat like animal proteins, fruits and vegetables pretty much to your heart's content. So it does make things a little bit difficult, like breakfast, for example. What do you have for breakfast? So that's a bit tricky. Um, fortunately, now there is a <coughs> um, plain, un plain processed beef protein, which has no additives in it. <coughs> so you can make yourself a smoothie for breakfast with fruit and greens and beef protein powder and maybe avocado or something like that. <clears throat> you know, it struck me when I was doing some work with the World Health Organization in the remote Pacific, uh, is that we'd be staying at one of these villages and, and one of the villages would drop a, drop breakfast around for us each morning. Um, and it was always just a fish, like a whole fish. There's your, there's yeah. your breakfast, there's a fish, sort yourself out. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> I know. It's just <laughs> like cereals and toasts and porridge is just a convention, you know, as you know, cereals came about with Mr. Kellogg, but um yeah, and so it's just become the norm. And most people, you know, like I, I did a um seminar once with a group of people and I was like, Okay, think back to your last meal. Why did you choose what you chose for your last meal? And that can be quite enlightening for people to answer that question, you know, why did you eat what you ate? Because most people just eat what they ate because that's what they've always eaten. Mm. That's what their parents fed them. There's no thought behind most people's meals. But anyway, I digress. So it's a, um, an elimination reintroduction diet. Um, so saying that, look, I think we need a lot more research around it because it's not the only elimination diet that would work um there was another st a study done and in just two weeks on rheumatoid arthritis and they eliminated red meat gluten dairy and nightshades and 50 percent of their um, participants had a 50 percent or more improvement in two weeks mm. so that's quite marked and they also increased, so they took out certain foods and they increased nutrient-dense foods. So by taking a whole lot of processed foods out and eating fruits and vegetables, you're eating a lot more um, colour, you're eating a lot more plant foods with the phytonutrients and polyphenols and all of those, but hopefully you're taking out the ones that have an aggra aggravating effect. So yeah, it's interesting with that because when you do these things, they're actually very high chance that the, there's just an appropriate dietary quality which is in of itself mm. useful and then you take out specific things and then you tend to say well it was those things as well and I suppose we just don't know just yet right yeah we don't know because there's a there's a there's a multi effect of changing those diets I mean you're changing multiple things you're taking out things that increase intestinal permeability and inflammation but you're also increasing the foods that will um, like we know with polyphenols, the, they get metabolized by your gut bacteria and some of those metabolites have been shown to be really good for your brain, um, for example. And they act as, polyphenols act as kind of a, a prebiotic. They can actually change the type of bacteria in your gut. So they improve, they suppress more of the kind of, not so good bacteria and increase the good bacteria and that in turn has an effect on gut inflammation and gut permeability and the health of your um, epithelial so 
yeah, you're doing multiple factors. And also you're encouraging people to eat things like, you know, eat more fish with omega-3 and mm-hmm. eat less bad fats. You know, especially if you take out fried food, you're going to take out a whole bunch of nasty damaged fats. Mm. So one thing that struck me, I was listening to you talk about your PhD research recently, was when you mm-hmm. talked about the, the clients or the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and they have these pain scores, if I'm really correct. And what struck me mm. for many of them, these are quite high. And mm. so that measurement is actually describing quite some disability due to the fact that they've got mm. rheumatoid arthritis. About mm. that? Yeah. And w- another, um, some of those things I, uh, the rapid three also ask questions about the difficulty or ease of doing everyday activities like turning a tap on and off, getting in and out of a car, walking three kilometres, um, taking part in uh, sort of physical activities. And some people, you know, early on, like, I can't do that at all, or I can only do that with much difficulty. And so over time, we also, the rapid three tracks those to the point where um, in pilot study I did some people were going I can I don't have any anything stopping me walking three kilometers now I can do that with ease whereas before it was difficult so yeah they are quite you know like physically disadvantaged because of the pain and the discomfort and and your initial results are saying that for at least some of the people they resolve many of those issues with this yeah so at least with um I think six out of nine people, you could see that there was an improvement whereby they got to, in in the um, <clears throat> patient acceptable zone or in the remission zone in both of those tests. And so when I see that, I wonder why more work isn't done in this area. Why, why are we not doing more work besides you? Why, why, are they, why is this not so heavily studied? Uh, because it takes somebody with motivation to do it, you know, and who has the motivation, who is in a position to do it, and yeah, well, who not, is not a, drug fund co- it? not a drug company or a food company. Yeah, it's not a drug company. It's not a food company. It's just, you know, people like me who are interested and think, you know, before my, before I die, I want to do something useful with my life. <laughs> Not that I'm about to drop dead, but you know what I mean? Well, I'm still capable and um, I've got the time and I've got the resources and I've got the brain with, why not, why not me? Yeah, that's cool. And one of the reasons that if clinicians that know something about food or elimination and know some of the results will often say, oh, well, I just don't think they'll do it. It's too hard. What do you make of that? Yeah, it is too hard for a lot of people. Yeah. I agree. Um. And that's something I would like, you know, like I, you know, I do, I'm still work with clients, you know, part time a little bit. Um, and it's, it's something I think we need to figure out a way around. Like I have some clients who'll go, yeah, um, that you give them the autoimmune protocol or something similar. Sometimes I modify it a bit and they'll just run away with it and do it exactly and you know start seeing results um and then they'll do the reintroduction exactly and find oh my gosh i had no idea but every time i ate almonds my pain would flare up for example Mm. um and then you have others and because of their lifestyle their environment whatever they'll take it away and in two two weeks later they'll go oh it was just too much for me to do right now so and Another possibility is a graduated way of doing it, which is what some people do. So instead of taking all the things out, you gra- you graduate. So take out gluten and dairy. And some people can get quite, I mean, this has been um, a case series with six people who just took gluten out of their diet with rheumatoid arthritis and got really good results. So it's possible that it could be one main trigger that you take out rather than all of the things and do it in a progressive way, like, okay, we've got improvements with that, let's try adding, taking this out as well, or this. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because I suppose if you think about 
Yeah, oh, well, yeah, I've gone from not being able to walk functionally well at all, or how to go and turn on a tap to being able to do that without any problems. You'd think that would be massively motivating. Yeah, I think it is for people when they get to that point. Right, sure. but they don't quite believe it, uh, and and they're ingrained in their food habits as well. Yeah, um, well, they don't give it, they don't even get to the point of giving it a go because it just seems too overwhelming. Um, I'm, and it's interesting because my study participants in, in the follow-up interviews, I'm like, what enabled you to do this stricter diet for eight weeks with almost no cheating or no cheating? <clears throat> and people are in a different space when they do um, a dietary study. It's like, I didn't want to let you down. I didn't want to let the study down. I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to show, I wanted to be able to do it so that your results would work, you know, like there was an external motivating factor. Yeah, in other words, in, in the, what we call implementation science, which is what in the real world, how many would actually do this if you ask them and go through the charts? It's not, it's not necessarily effective in a trial. Yeah, and, and I think um, in my earlier study too, where I just interviewed people who'd taken it on by themselves and not as part of a study, maybe their health professional had recommended it or a friend had recommended it, um, there were certain common factors that made people successful. Um, there's like this kind of drive to be physically capable person and not rely on drugs for themselves, for their family, um, for their future. So that was one thing. Another thing I noticed, I noticed was they all had a good form of support. So whether it was a daughter, a best friend, a partner, a mother, whatever, they had somebody in their life who was like um, just Ch wanting Ch them to be me. successful and supporting them and giving them recipes and asking how they were doing and all that sort of stuff. And it was the same in my, in my participants as well. Um, pretty much all of them, even a woman that lived by herself, she had a good friend who was supporting her. So I think these other factors need to be taken into account when we um, work with um, our clients. It's like, what, what's the environment like for them? And is it going to have them succeed? Yeah, when you say that, I guess it think to me that there's still a, a, yeah, a couple of lifetimes of work to do here to, to mm -hmm. unpack all of those and really nail our behavior chains with these protocols. Mm. And you know, maybe it's going to be something around more precise real-time measurement. Some, you know, your watch will tell you the amount of inflammation and pain that you're experiencing or some other measure or something, I don't know, but yeah, and, and you can see that track quickly up and down. Maybe mm. there's a, a whole bunch of things that will eventually to help, get help in yeah. the future. Yeah, I mean, we've got all these smartwatches now. I mean, if you could have some kind of app that monitored pain or that you could just easily input stuff on a day-to-day -day basis that would track how you're going, that would help and give you immediate feedback. Yeah. Kaylee, you've been listening carefully. Oh, uh, just so interesting. It's so cool to have you on, Julianne. I think for me, what I found most interesting was the profound effect that gluten and dairy can have, just taking those two things out. Could you expand a little bit more on that and why that might be for some people? I mean, mm. It seems like there's a raging pandemic of, of gluten intolerance. Every second person you talk to has a bit of a gluten insensitivity going on. And I wonder, is there something more to that? Very good question. Um, I think a number of things are happening. So if we look at... Um, one of the connections between autoimmune disease over time is infections. So infections, infectious disease has fallen dramatically and autoimmune disease has gone up. One of the connecting factors here is cl being clean and having um, a suppressed microbiome. Yep. And that, um, so this is the first thing, it, um, it seems to have an effect on how your immune system is developed in the very early years. Yeah. 
Um, so that's all our cleaning. And we've got clean food. We've got free, frozen food, cold food, no bacteria, no soil bacteria, no fermented foods anymore to preserve them. Um, so there's all of that side. So our gut microbiome is really, really not great. So that's a big part of our immune system. Um, the next thing is, I think, the sheer amount of wheat we are eating. So if you look at the average New Zealand diet, um, the average New Zealand diet has 200 grams of wheat a day. That's 800 calories. That's a third of your diet comes from one single food. That's huge. So I think our diets have become incredibly unbalanced. You know, we have cereal for breakfast, pasta for lunch, um, bread, muffins, cakes. If you look at it, we've got a thousand different foods all made out of one ingredient. And it's highly refined. And the way we grow our wheat, the um, gluten amount has, the wheat has changed because of hybridization as well. And I think that's another factor. Um, but also with autoimmune disease, that, that gut food interaction, um, and celiac disease, what we know is that gluten interacts with a receptor on your gut epithelium. That gut epithelium sends out a chemical called zonulin, and zonulin directly opens the tight junctions. So these are the little like protein laces that each gut epithelial cell holds on tight to its neighbor via. So in um, celiac disease, we get this big increase with zonulin and big amounts of leaky gut and then you get all these partially broken down proteins from food, from bacteria, from whatever's in the gut flowing through into that sub-epithelial space where you've got all your immune system. So that's that. Um, autoimmune diseases. So can I just ask you one question there, Jeanette? So, I mean, to get a full diagnosis of celiac disease, it actually has to be pretty bad pathology, but presumably you can have that same mechanism happening. But yep. with some sort of sensitivity, I guess, rather than, you know, yep. fail with that's biopsy a, or whatever you have to do to get to Yeah, it. that's exactly right. So some um, studies, they've measured um, zonulin and serum zonulin. Um, and with people with autoimmune disease have larger, tends to have higher amount, not, not like celiac disease when they're exposed to gluten, but they have higher amounts of zonulin, which means they've got this leaky gut so it could be that um and Fasano would say there's a spectrum you get people with celiac disease and then there's people that can eat all the beer and pizza they want and never get sick and never get autoimmune diseases or anything and then there's this gray area in between with non-celiac or um, non-celiac wheat or gluten sensitivity and it seems that people with autoimmune diseases have higher amounts of non-celiac gluten or wheat sensitivity and it could be the interaction of gluten with the zonulin causing the um, tight junctions to loosen. Um, and it could also be compounded by the other factors. So, you know, um, as we age, you get more zonulin. So one of the studies they did was with elderly people in a rest home, which is super interesting. They measured their zonulin and they measured by the, and their gut permeability. And then they gave them... I think about four or five servings of high polyphenol foods a day and their zonulin levels decreased. So when you look after your gut bacteria via polyphenols or, you know, the right kinds of foods, they didn't even take any foods out of the diet. They just added polyphenols in and their zonulin levels went down. Yeah, they could probably take muffins or yeah, they, croissants out of it as well or something, I suppose. Yeah, but they wanted, you know, just... They had a control which had normal diet, and they did a crossover as well, which was interesting. So it was a good study. Is there any, any studies that you know about where they've actually, yeah, there's immediately, what I want to know is we take 10,000 people in the population, you know, a, a decent representative sample, and what proportion have, have any of these, these sensitivities or anxiety to get higher? Is that, you know, is it 3%, is it 10%, is it 40%? Yeah, that's a good question, and I haven't looked into it, but yeah. I mean, we do know that, yeah, with autoimmune diseases, there is a, a larger amount of non-celiac wheat sensitivity. 
and that's with Hashimoto's as well as you know, every other autoimmune disease. Is there, any, did, is there anything on, on the prevalence of autoimmune diseases overall? Like if you talk a thousand people, how many have got something that resembles this? Um, yeah, I don't know the stats. I know with um, rheumatoid arthritis, it's two, two and a half percent of the population mm. in New Zealand. Hashimoto's is the most common thyroid issue. I think it affects about one in a hundred. Yeah, let's start to eat all those different things up. There's, there's probably a reasonable number that we've got some of these. So, Julianne, the other question I had was just obviously around dairy, and it's kind of become really common around people who are interested in nutrition and in health and well-being around the difference between A1 and A2 dairy. I mean, you see it in the supermarket now. It's a thing you can buy. So why would people even think about cutting out half of the dairy? Um, yeah, dairy, well... To go back to celiac disease for a minute, if you put, they did a study where they put, um, so with celiac disease, if you put a, um, a pair, they, they do a, a rectal um, thing where they put gluten against your rectum and look at the amount of inflammation that happens. And 50% of people with celiac disease, they get very similar levels of inflammation when they put casein, which is the um, protein in dairy. On this, in this rectal pad thing that they put on. This sounds so, awful. <laughs> I know. I was like, interesting study, but people do these things. People, <laughs> people sign up for them as well. That's the other thing. Um, so, yeah, so casein seems to be um, an inflammatory protein in people, especially ones that people that seem, uh, a percentage of people that are sensitive to gluten. Um, there are sub in one study there was a subset of people in rheumatoid. I can't remember the exact factors they had, but if they had certain factors, they were all um, had a reaction to dairy when they ate it. Um, a one and A two. I'm not hugely um, up on how different they are, but the casein is different. It breaks down differently in A one and A two, um, and I know people who told me that they will get um, mucousy with normal A1, but they won't with A2 because the protein has a different effect in the body. And there was a study done on um, Chinese kids, I believe, who kind of had more neuro effects from dairy, um, like foggy brain and stuff like that. I may have got this a bit wrong, but um, they were fine with A2, but not with A1 dairy. That was done a couple of years ago, I think. That's really interesting. And I suppose the other part of that is the, we were talking in the last podcast about protein and different types of protein supplements. And mm -hmm. you hear a lot of people saying that they tend towards plant proteins like pea protein because it's softer on the gut than whey. Um, would you say that that's the case for people with autoimmune disease? Um, it depends a bit on the pea protein. And how many, how much of the lectin side of it is left in? So, a um, couple of my recent clients have done fine on some brands of pea protein, but they have to stick to that brand. Is that leucine though? Is that a missing ingredient? Is that only in weight? Yeah, I'm not sure what the leucine content of pea protein is. Yeah, I did look it up, but I've forgotten. I'm sorry. Um, but you were yeah, saying I that mean, the, the idea of the leftover lectins, can you talk a bit more about that and why that could be an issue for some people? Yeah, so the lectins seem to be the things in um, seeds that are protective. I'm not sure the exact mechanism, but they interact with the gut and cause inflammation. And they seem to be the problem um, with the seed part of plants which is why they're removed on the autoimmune protocol. So if you think about seeds, all seeds, their whole role in life, if you like, not that they think about it, is to get planted and grow a new plant. So a seed has to protect itself from being digested by creatures. And they have like hard coatings or they taste nasty like lemon pips or they have um, irritating 
chemicals or lectins or whatever so that they avoid digestion or get pooped out quite quickly. But what we humans do is we take those seeds and we grind them up and make them into food, which kind of seems a little bit crazy when you think about the effect that negative effect that some seeds might have on people. And if you think about um, ancestrally what humans did with seeds, like legumes and grains and things, they soaked them for a long time. They fermented them. They rotted them. They did all kinds of things. Um, and FAO has got a really good website on how much or how different ancestral cultures worked um, with their grains and their seeds. And there was a lot of soaking and fermenting and cooking. To, and that breaks down those kind of lectins that we find very difficult to digest or interact negatively with our gut. Um, and then, you know, if you're a cow, you have a whole fermentation of bacteria breaking down all that stuff before it even gets to your system. That's a fabulous explanation. I think we're going on longer than we thought purely because Kate and I learned it so much, um, which is a little <laughs> bit unfair to be perfectly honest, but. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, anything else, Carol? I think we're pretty much getting there, but that's been really cool. Yeah, I, I, all the questions I had, Julianne pretty much answered. It was awesome. Um, oh, just cool. such such a wealth of knowledge, Julianne. It's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>